Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Welcome again to the Gay Buddhist Fellowship. We use this opportunity to introduce ourselves to each other. My name is Harvard. I'm Roger. I'm Randy. I'm Paul. Larry. I'm Miguel. Rick. Kay. Nicholas. Carl. Scott. Snake. Bob. <laughs> Peter. Mark. Jack. Jim. Paul. Marty. David. Lee. I'm George. And I'm Bob. study of social engaged Buddhism 
and there's a lot that we cover in six months. So that's the program that I run. And I live in a uh, intentionally uh, intentional community of other social engaged Buddhists here at Mission, just about four blocks away. Um, so one thing I wanted to offer you today was a parable that I was taught when I was in Burma at the first monastery I studied in. And um, okay, so <laughs> there on another world in another time, <clears throat> there was a planet covered in water. And just below the water was sand. And there were a lot of currents on the on the planet's surface. Um, so these sandbars would develop. And there were people who lived on this planet. And they would swim hard and try to end up on these sandbars, especially the ones that were above water. They were prime real estate. And when they could gather themselves enough on these sandbars, they would try to collect uh, driftwood. I guess there must have been trees also on this planet for there to be driftwood. Um, and they would try to assemble some degree of safety from living uh, surrounded by all this water and these constant currents. But no matter how much they worked and how skillful they assembled their driftwood barricades, uh, currents would always wash uh, by the island, changing the sand. And then there were floods. There were always storms and floods that would come by. And the stronger the flood, obviously the more precarious the lives of the people. And many were washed down to the next sandbar. So yeah, their whole life, their whole worldview, their whole orientation um, was in relationship to the river. And their need to be close to the river where all their food was and many of their resources came from the river. And yet being much like ourselves, uh, the river not really being a safe home. So they would try to live on these sandbars, build up these sandbars, try to find the biggest sandbar they could live on for their own protection, but not live too far from the water because they needed it for many reasons, drinking. And that was sort of the backdrop of these people living <clears throat> on this planet in this way. Living next to a river, swimming lessons were very important because people were constantly being, as they would go down to get water, they would be swept away. They might fall into the river. So every day they would practice swimming for about a half an hour. And then more courageous people would actually try to go to the very upstream end of an island, get in the water, and practice being in the river, and then catch the bottom of the sandbar before they were swept away. And that was sort of a, a courageous feat and to attune yourself more to the river. Um, often young men, but some young women would uh, test themselves in the river. And one time on one island, there was a community of people and a large flood came. A huge storm passed by, brought all this water. And it washed away an entire people. Uh, downstream and thrown into the river, especially during a flood, it was very, very painful and frightening <clears throat> and uh, uh, many people suffered. But one young man uh, who had become a very strong swimmer learned to navigate in the river. He learned to um, swim in the currents and not just close to land, but he had become a strong swimmer. So he knew how to be in the river, more on its terms, more in the river, uh, learning how to uh, negotiate different obstacles in the river.
And from that, when he found his next landmark and the people who were living down there, he was able to shed light on what it was like to be in the river. When the side of the Burmese teacher that I studied with was giving this parable, it was obviously to encourage us to flow more with time and to accept the fact that there are great instabilities in our life. But this parable meant a lot to me because for 12 years of my youth, I did a lot of canoeing up in Canada, up in the lakes and rivers up there. And one thing I, when I was 12, there was a, and we'd get on a river, you can't help but sort of fight against the river. You have this canoe, you have these massive forces, and you think it's up to you to paddle and get your canoe from one place to another, and you end up fighting the river somewhat. But over time, you learn to let the river do most of the work, and the effort you put in when being in strong currents shifts, and it's not something you can describe, you can describe it, but you actually have to have experience of being in a canoe fully loaded with gear, maybe 600 pounds or more, in these very strong currents. And you realize that you can even go upstream in a heavy canoe if you know how to work with the currents of the river. And that's one thing I realized in very deep meditation in Burma, was that a lot of what I thought was up to me, a lot of the effort I was going to make in my practice, if it wasn't in tune with what was actually happening, it often was counterproductive. But to make no effort wasn't much help either. There was a sort of sense of being adrift. So learning to work with the circumstances you find yourself in, and learning to adjust as harmoniously as possible to these shifting conditions, and even radically shifting conditions like the flood that swept across this island, was a helpful orientation. My father, as I said, taught German, and he studied mostly East Germany and West Germany, so he became also a professor of Marxism. And my mother was a neurobiologist, and I had these very strong experiences out in the wilderness. And those are three ways that I came to Buddhist meditation, was that Western scientific materialism, the Marxism and the type of values, the insights into the human condition on a more social level, and then the profound experiences that were happening to me out in the wilderness, where you were really open and vulnerable to large forces like storms and winds. But there's a different type of harmony that can be found out camping or out in the wilderness when you learn to attune yourself to it. I think that's some of the reason that we do like to get out of the city, is that we do reconnect to that orientation that we can find in the wilderness. And yet we also prefer city life because it's a little bit more predictable, a little bit more comfortable. And then how we use meditation in our life 
is it fit? It can be like those swimming lessons where we dip ourselves in the water once a day and learn to flow with life as it is. Or we might try to actually go deeper and integrate mindfulness into most of our waking life. When the um, when the Buddha uh, set off on his journey, his first inclination was to find a solution to old age, sickness, and death. But his insights were there, that there wasn't really much of a solution to old age, sickness, and death as far as overcoming them. And he became much more attuned to what was happening inside than how to arrange one's life to not suffer. He became much more focused on inner growth. And he <clears throat> talks of... Uh, he has a category um, called the floods. And there are, uh, just to back up, I, I don't know if you know many, if you know the uh, Buddha's life story, but he grew up in the, um, near the Ganges River in India. And it's a, it's a very flat river plain for most of it when it comes out of the Himalayas. So um, flooding happens there every year, and it can be very severe. And there are actually a lot of parables and stories from the time of the Buddha of people being affected by floods and the type of devastation that would bring. And so as he would go around and talk, he could talk about floods, and people would say, yes, floods are a problem. And he said, the external floods are not the biggest problem. It's the internal floods that are. We get flooded by strong emotion and flooded by circumstances that are out of our control. And learning to uh, learning to swim in circumstances that are out of our control and find a different orientation to being in life that um, that is so unpredictable um, was important for him. For example, um, I'd set my alarm to wake up this morning at 8 o'clock, but at 7 o'clock, the police rang my door. <laughs> and in a very groggy state, they opened up my door and I'm on the third floor and I went to see who's ringing. And the police went to up and and said, um, you have to move your car. There's a festival happening on the street where you're parked. Um, and so, they were just about to tow it. So I hoped that more of a peaceful morning suddenly turned into this, um, you know, just this uh, uh, thrust into a new circumstance. Uh, and I was in my most tired, groggy state. It was not how I would have wanted to wake up this morning. But um, I was running down the stairs with my car keys, and then my housemate threw me her car keys. <laughs> I had to juggle cars in the morning. Um, and being a little tired, I had um, the thoughts that came up were not the most balanced. <laughs> I hate San Francisco and parking such a drag, and around, 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 around. Um, but once I came to terms with this, was a truth, and that tow trucks were coming, and the best thing to do would be to move the car. And once I let go of the fact that I was robbed of sleep that I had planned on. Um, actually, it was nice to get up that early because it's such a beautiful sunny morning. So the, being able to turn around when you have plans and they're dashed, the turnaround time can end a lot of uh, a lot of suffering. Uh, I could have gone on for hours in uh, a flustered state. Also, um, I seem to have woken up with a bit of a cold this morning. And uh, on my second cup of tea, <laughs> I'm 
trying to bring a little more clarity than just a foggy mind might have brought to this group. Um, uh, it's helped some, but not as much as I would have hoped. Um, that's another circumstance that uh, affects many people. Is the illnesses that come. There's getting your car towed, and there's physical or emotional stress. When I was in Burma, the the year that I spent there, I was actually quite healthy. I went over with five Westerners, and four of them struggled within the first week they got there, and they struggled the entire time they were there with different ailments. And uh, they didn't like the food, they didn't like the heat, they didn't like the bugs, they didn't <laughs> like many things. <laughs> and I was stressed by all that, but I actually never got physically ill, um, so I didn't suffer to the same degree that they did. But at the end of that year, I actually got quite ill. Um, and I fell uh, into a great, great deep fatigue. Um, and it's six years later, and I still have that deep fatigue as a backdrop to my life. And as much as I could. Um, be upset that that had happened. Just like the people who live on a planet covered in water, it's just built into their circumstance that floods happen. They don't live elsewhere. And I happen to live on a planet where great illness is possible, even in a modern world with as much control as we try to bring to our circumstance. Um, out of the blue, I got extremely ill. <clears throat> and the illness took a lot from me, my ability to be in the world. I had a 30-year-old male, you know, pretty healthy approach to my life. And that was taken um, pretty much overnight. And slowly come back. And the reason it's come back is I've learned to orient myself to being um, chronically ill, but being okay with that and learning to work with um, the circumstances I find myself in and not wishing it was other, and learning to swim in this uh, incredible flood that suddenly crashed in upon my life. What's fascinating to me is that there was a time when I was bed bedridden at my father's house and I would be sleeping 14 hours a day and then laying on his couch for another six hours a day. Um, and there was just so much um, bone aching fatigue and my mind was very cloudy. Yet I had a year of solid strong meditation before that. And so it was a very strange mixture of being um, very aware of a lot of suffering. And um, it's more awareness than I wish I had had to seeing suffering that up close and personal. Um, and yet, because of some momentum of awareness that could possibly meet that much catastrophe, I was able to actually learn over many months of being very ill, how to align myself, realign myself in this new uh, experience. It was very much like that uh, hero in the story, who, where many people get swept into uh, difficulties that come up in their life. But um, to actually, to actually learn to wake up within the middle of your life as it is. So if it's flat water and very peaceful, that's fine. You wake up to a sense of peace. If it's a swiftly flowing current, you wake up, and that's what life is. If it's a waterfall or treacherous rapids, that's also where you happen to be. 
and you can wake up from that. So waking up in the midst of this very deep chronic illness um, was a very strong turning point for me um, in how I approach my life, how I approach effort, what I think the standards are that I'm living by, the, um, the way a young man, fairly able-bodied for the first 30 years, all that reference um, was not helpful when I was um, when I became that ill. But because I was, I began to actually tune into things as they were. My energy was less wasted in struggling against things as they are. And that's where the fatigue began to turn around and changing some very deep habits around how I negotiate my life um, began to put my energy more in line with the, the river I was in. That's very much what I noticed when I was canoeing, is that you can, I don't know if any of you have ever gone canoeing, but <clears throat> you can have fast running water going downstream, even between two huge rocks where it really funnels um, but because it funnels, it creates these eddies where the water actually goes back upstream. And it's very strange going upriver. You can go upriver for, I've done it for, like for a week solid. And there are ways that the river can suck you up the stream if you know how to recognize the eddies, if you know how to work with the currents as they are. And learning how to... Um, work with my circumstances of my life when I was that ill and find the uh, find the currents that were where I was being drawn to um, was, a, was a great orientation. Then to get a little more healthy and start working at the Buddhist Peace Fellowship it's just been a whole other chapter. Very fascinating because I was surrounded by activists um, and there are people who are very willful, very passionate, um, trying to evoke change. It's not a place to tune into things as they are. I keep tuning to things as they are. It's often like you do that with one breath and spend the next 40 trying to have an impact on where things are. And I didn't have those tools I did when I was younger, but um, with this illness, I was drawn to that type of work, but those tools of being willful about how to uh, evoke change just were not there. <clears throat> so uh, I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. And it's right on the north end of this beautiful bay, the Narragansett Bay. And I did some sailing when I was younger. So the the big orientation that I had after the illness when I learned to work with it was less of a canoeing thing where I had a paddle and I was putting in some effort letting the river do most of the work. And it's a little bit more like sailing where you set your sails and you work with the wind of the day so that um, if there's no wind you don't go very far, but that's fine. There's not much you can do about it. That's what sailing's like. And if there's a lot of wind, you go very far. And it's the same with activism for me now, that I set my sails and wait, and the winds of compassion, and the winds of curiosity, the winds of friendship, very positive energies arise that want to participate in the world but they're not at all my making. You don't make wind when you sail. You have to receive it. And that, for a young uh, Western contemporary person, there's a big fear that if you stop putting in effort that you would achieve anything. And you don't want to just watch TV and space out. But if you set your sails, 
there will be passions that arise that will carry you very far. But you won't have to struggle and fight against the way things are. The way things are will provide the motivation that can be very wholesome and very in line with the way things are that move you forward and bring about change. And that's an interesting balance to try to strike, is to participate wakefully in the world um, with strong currents, strong winds, and keep trying to find the flow of what's actually happening and not be passive and neglectful and um, not trim your sails or put away the paddle, but keep feeling out where the current is and letting uh, your participation in the world provide the, the motivation, the winds that arise that uh, propel you forward without much striving or struggle. And that's one quote, one short quote from the Buddha um, when asked how he crossed the river of samsara. He said without uh, striving and without standing still, I crossed. So finding that balance of effort that neither fights against things as they are nor becomes complacent um, is an important is an important attunement to the effort we use in life. <clears throat> and you can feel that in your meditation practice where uh, the mind will do almost as it will with very little influence. And yet you can have some influence over time. And sometimes the mind is very uh, suggestible and sometimes it's not. So having on the one hand, a very open, um, accepting, patient quality to one's practice and how one actually approaches your life. And on the other, being participating with it, being in a dance with it, seeing where the opening is, trying to evoke, uh, evoke some change from By being in the moment and attuned with it, change will occur. And it's not a change that comes from struggle and non-acceptance. Um, it can come from deep acceptance and deep patience. And that's one paradox that um, I find quite amazing. And then to see it play out in the Buddhist Peace Fellowship, where so much, there's so much urgency, urgency for change. Um, it's amazing when it act, when you see it actually happen. And <clears throat> last year, about this time, when the, uh, the war in Iraq was looming, and there was this hope that we could do something to block this flood coming. And then to see it kind of crash over us and watch everybody at the Buddhist Peace Fellowship in our community and the interfaith community and the Bay Area. Um, many people try to avert this flood coming. And to see that all that effort was great, but to the degree that it also lost acceptance, it was a big burnout. And there's a lot of bitterness. And I think. Everybody who tried to make a difference did it very nobly. And I wouldn't expect any of us to be perfect um, in being attuned with such a large flood. But looking at how things actually occurred, <clears throat> coming to terms with that, and then flowing forward without still struggling against what had occurred and how things are now, um, will lead to a solution. Um, I have a lot of faith in that, but um, it's scary, given how strong the forces are, to not have a plan and not have more of a doing strategy around how to bring about big change. 
but it's not a faith that is compl- uh, complacent. I'm, I'm participating every day in trying to evoke change, but um, to the degree that I struggle and I'm bitter with the way things are, it um, doesn't seem to go very far. It seems to provide energy, but it's a struggling energy. It tends to burn people out and make our tactics um, counterproductive in the long run. Um, <clears throat> that's about 40 minutes, and I'd like to open it up to more of a question and answer dialogue. these interns that have just come for the summer. And one of the things they'll be working on will be impacting the elections. And there's a lot of hatred towards the current administration. And if you look at uh, what happened in South Africa with the Truth and Reconciliation, we were talking about that yesterday. Of The ultimate goal is reconciliation, not defeating an opponent because a, a defeated opponent is not the end of the story. They're defeated, they're bitter, they regroup, they fight back. And how do you remove someone from power if you, um, I don't know, I, I don't want to say that because we're in San Francisco and everybody mm-hmm. agrees with my political, but just use it as, a, um, as one view. Um, if you think someone's causing harm, <clears throat> working to remove them from power so that they can do less harm, but not and not using your own anger and frustration, the energy that comes from that is ready to grab the paddle and fight. And that's the wind that can blow a sailboat is so much stronger than what I could wield with one paddle. Um, so. I have to be careful how I approach that situation because there is a lot of passion around it. And the passion can be the wind in my sails, but I have to watch out how I get locked in on the goal, locked in on a certain view, and then start funneling my energy towards that. And it does obscure things that I think would lead to a solution. Um, It would lead, is there goodness to um, to count on or to reach out to. And if you look at any time you've been in conflict, <clears throat> someone bitterly hated you and you bitterly hated them, but you cared enough about them that you can actually come to the other side of conflict and see how much your own view, as sharp and precise as it seemed, as much as you were in the right and they were in the wrong, it was holding you in conflict. And that the opposite side of or the the transition side, the fruition side of coming through conflict peacefully, you can look back at the view you had and see how much it was um, your own obstacle towards the solution. And then listening to the other person, expressing yourself, listening, participating, but having faith that there was something good in this person, trying to get out of the box of that view without becoming a pushover or a doormat. That doesn't help the conflict. 
So what this will look like on the other side, um, the people that I'm most embittered with are probably not as bad as I think they are. In certain areas they may be, and they may be worse, but the whole picture of who they are, um, true and lasting change would come from having a, um, a holistic view, a larger view of who they are, and dialoguing with that but still removing them from power because they're in a place where I think that they're caught in a place this is an interpretation my interpretation that happened to be this is my interpretation (laughs) is to um, when people are caught in their own wrong view they can do a lot of harm and taking that person out of a place where they're causing harm and perpetuating their own struggle I'm angry at you, so I fight you, you hit back, I'm angry, and I, it's like some point you gotta like take the weapons out of my hands because I just, I'm just causing myself more disturbance. And then de-escalate, and then try to come at it again. Um, and I guess, you know, the enemy I had in mind wasn't really there. Um, so I hope that that's possible for even um, people who want to go to war. I'm wondering about excuse me, your experience in Burma, which, if I remember right, has a military government yeah. and has repressed the legally elected president. Yeah. Did you see these principles? It's a Buddhist country, right? Yeah. Did you see these principles at work among the people, and what's the status? Um, I actually didn't see it. It was, it was disturbing. I prepared myself to see it before going over there. And what was eerie was how little it was actually visible. It was felt, but it was very hidden. And what I learned is that the way tourists and Westerners move within that country, um, they, they funnel you from place to place. It's very difficult to step out of that stream. You're only there for so long. They, they only let you stay in certain places. And so you can go your whole time there and not really see the military presence. And yet, <clears throat> I had a meditation visa when I was there. So I was allowed to travel for a couple of months. And I would meet these beautiful um, Burmese uh, youth who would be studying English. And I would get to talk to them. And I realized that they should be in the Why aren't you guys in the university? All the universities were shut down. Why are they shut down? And they don't want to talk about it. I look around and we're at a small cafe. No one's even in earshot. They trust me but they won't even talk about why the universities were shut down. And you begin to feel the oppression. You can see the signs of it, but the over-oppression is not that obvious. And then once you go into the monasteries, it's, it's completely invisible. Um, you're there to meditate, and uh, you're silent most of the time. It's a very inner experience, and, and working with teachers and other monastics. <clears throat> so I was amazed to have spent a whole year there and not have seen more of it. And yet, what I did see gave me the impression of the amount of um, repression that is there. But it wasn't, it was shocking how how unobvious it was and how hidden they actually made it. And you're intentionally calling it from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, me and Mars too hard to say. But it's also, (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's funny because um, I want to help these Burmese teachers come and practice, but if I keep calling it Burma on any kind of official document, it's a red flag for that government that, I, that I'm not in line with it. And that's that's an interesting dance to look at what the priorities are, what the goals are, what, uh, where do I want to stand, and do I want to capitulate to allow something else to happen? Is that flowing? Or is that, could I take a stand there? That was the one, two. See, this is a short question. Okay. The lady, uh, the woman, Aung San Suu Kyi. Yeah. Uh, she's still in her house resident, right? I suppose. Or? <laughs> um, yes, it, it changes a lot. And it was about to change a few weeks ago. And I don't know if that change happened or not. They were about to let her free, but then I think they had second thoughts about it, so I don't know 
that she goes in and out of house arrest um, a lot. So she's never allowed to leave the country? Right, she wouldn't be left back in if she left. She would not. Never be left back. Yeah. But her story is amazing, and the way that she's learned to to orient herself to things as they are, be active, and yet use non-struggle. Like, it's hard, because the language is weird, that you can be very effortful, very in line with your heart, and still radically accepting the things as they are, and keep turning towards acceptance and participation at the same time. And she's a great example. Um, yeah, thanks for your insight and your experience. It was great to hear. Um, yesterday we went hiking up to the Stinson Beach, and um, we were reading the sign about the rip, the currents, and it was interesting because I had been thinking about how when people get in a rip tide, it brings you out, and people struggle in it, and they're trying to get back into shore. Right. And if you are aware that what's happening is it's only in a small area and if you swim along the shore through instead of trying to swim against it right kind of flow with it you'll get out of the tunnel that's taking you out and it's kind of like um, so you have to have that awareness and for me it's like struggles we don't I mean we want to ask why you know we don't Except, or we don't, we don't have the big picture as easy as that. Like causes and conditions, karma. We don't know, you know. And so, where does that? I mean, we we really don't know. So, I mean, it's very simple in riptide, but in life, we don't really know what our um, causes and conditions are. Mm. That is also a great example. If you don't swim, you'll be sucked out of the sea. If you swim towards where you think the goal is, you'll exhaust yourself. It's this kind of perpendicular option to the current that you'd have to really understand the setup. That happens a lot with this peace fellowship where someone comes in and they're like, here's this problem, we must do something about it. And so this energy comes up like, yes, it's a big problem, we have to do something. And people are so overwhelmed, there's this strength like, oh, I can't do one more thing, I am so stretched. And there's this and, and some sort of like, come on, come on, no, I can't, I can't, come on, come on. And sometimes like, what's that? <laughs> and you sort of just redirect <laughs> over here and just get out of that, that strain. Do more, I can't, I need to do less, do more. And just take it somewhere else. And then most people are a little bit more grounded. What is the problem? What's going on? Where are their resources? But first getting out of this um, sink or swim pen. I have to do that a lot with most of That's a great question. I think it's time for one more question. Yeah, um, I was up early. I've been uh, visited by uh, rich Republican relatives. I was up in California to see their son who was going from the West Coast to be in a triathlon, which is very early in town. So I've seen thousands of intent, focused, vigorous, Unhappy people, yeah. Yeah. you know, coming out of the water from all the chest and then, you know, running. It, it, it seemed that once, you know, a part of me is hatefully envious that I know I will never have a body. <laughs> I, I just will never do that. But, um, but part of it is because I don't comprehend the use of time in that way for so little general general good. I mean, not the And if someone can enlighten me on this, I would appreciate it because. It seems like a gigantic waste of time. I mean, how honed can you be physically? Uh, and yet, there were blind people running. Um, there were amputees, you know, who had different um, hook-ons for different events. It, there were there were impressive aspects of it. But I, I just thought, oh my God, I'm in the wrong place. You know, I don't get it. Um, they could be building schools. They could be, I don't know. Both. And I wouldn't even greet the people who yelled at them. I wouldn't even smile and wave. One guy stopped and kissed them. And I thought, this is transformative anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> but when you're talking about effort, I mean, here they were. Now, it was a perfect example. They were told to swim towards the city and the current would bring them to the marina. And it you know, did. But they don't slap out of the water like, but something from another planet, I don't know, I was in the wrong place. But, um, <laughs> What is, our, is our society screwed?
room with misplaced effort? I mean, I think it is. I think you probably find that in every culture. We have certain patterns that are very deep and unique to us, and there's a lot of stress on the individual, the heights an individual can reach. But you can find examples of that even in Burma. Has that translated in your life, I mean, the canoeing and sailing, I mean, your physical life into your spiritual practice? Do you see that that one has strengthened one? I have, and it's an intuitive art. So it's not something that can be taught. It can be pointed to in poetry sometimes. But actually then becoming aligned, and not just when things are peaceful, but when things are challenging or you're tired, where it's having it expand into other areas. So I think we're all expanding our ability to flow without being apathetic and to participate without being aggressive. And, you know, there are some few people in that marathon that are probably very in flow, and that's their gift, and that's their participation with the planet. That's flowing for them. And other people, it could be the motivation could be really skewed, and they probably are the least happy, the most driven and the least happy. But to someone who can stop and kiss somebody, even while being trained in that thing, is probably somewhere there. That's their flowing gift to the planet. Thank you all very much. I have one more tiny announcement, is that I'm leading a five-day team retreat in actually two of them, one in June and one in July. So there's that. If any of you have now any teenagers that are interested in meditation, there's some flyers for that. But also any dhamma that might be offered today is going to go into a scholarship for teenagers. If you want to offer that to these teens, so that a few of them who can't afford it could attend, that would be most appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm the host this morning. We'll have some refreshment, so feel free to stay around and enjoy the company of other members and enjoy the refreshment. When you use tea cups, please wash the one you use and put it back. Also, we have a dana ball out there. It's just a purplish colored plastic ball. You can't miss it. And please put some money in there. Our suggested guideline is $5. If you can put in more, by all means, please do so. If you cannot, put in whatever you can. But please help GBF in terms of its financial help as well as its spiritual growth. Thank you very much. I'm Jack. Today is the newsletter. We know I'm there bi-monthly. We'll get to Baldwin's day one stamp and play Baldwin at the table. Volunteer for that for a few minutes after social media. Do you have a few minutes? Good evening. Sounds like some kind of a good thing. It sounds like some good lyrics for a graphic musical. Bold, stable, stamp, and play. Sorry, what was the name? Bold, stable, stamp, and play. I'm Peter. I'm the coordinator for hosts. Speaking about volunteering, our roster of hosts, Kay is the host today, has had some attrition, so we need some more volunteers. It happens once every two months that you bring some goodies and serves a kind of formal point of view for newcomers. If anybody's willing to do that, please see me afterwards. We need two people so that we don't go a goodie list on any Sunday. And my announcement is just next 
Sunday. I'm having a memorial service for my partner, uh, Steve Deskin, and you're invited if you feel like coming. So it's next Sunday from 2 to 5 uh, at what used to be called the Recreational Center for the Handicapped, or the Jenna Pomeroy Center, which is behind the zoo at 207 Skyline. And a reminder that our talks are available on the internet at the GBF website, gaybuddhist.org. Is, is there anybody here for the first time today? Okay, well, welcome. Thank you. So there is a sign up sheet uh, near the dining hall if you want to get on the email. I think I spoke with Paul. He's kind enough to give me the direct contact for the next month for the new year. I'm going to stand and take one of those Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.